So, okay, I'm coming to you from the site of Histria in modern Romania. It's a Greco-Roman city that existed for several hundred years. Um, and I want to talk to you about uh, the study of bioarchaeology of human remains in the past. In this excavation in 2019, we uncovered a beautiful uh, kiln, which you can see behind me. It's the circular feature behind my head with little holes. It's the firing floor. But nearby, we also uncovered a series of Roman graves. Um, from children. And so studying human remains from the past is a very thorny issue for several reasons. Um, for one, there are many people today for various reasons who are uncomfortable with uh, looking at human remains from the past. And so I want to warn you that this lecture will include images of human remains. And so if that makes you uncomfortable for a variety of ethical or cultural reasons, please do not feel obligated to see this video. Um, archaeologists today, mostly, um, try to work very carefully with modern descendant communities um, to respect their wishes with their ancestors. We are excavating past people, people who were children, siblings, parents, friends, lovers of people. And so they were people. <laughs> I know that that sounds very repetitive, but we need to constantly remember that we are dealing with past people that deserve our respect and care, even as we try to understand the lives of these past people from their remains. The early history of the study of human re remains is fraught with insensitivity. Early excavators were not very sensitive to the fact that they were often excavating the remains of past people. Many excavations were there simply for the artifacts in gold or otherwise, um, and not to understand the remains of these humans. Um, and so this created lots of issues, particularly um, due to the colonial environment that these early excavators were in. Um, by today's standards, many of them were probably no better than grave robbers or adventurers. Today, of course, we try to be much more sensitive to local concerns and we work and cooperate with local descendants to treat remains very carefully. Um, in particular, there was this boom in mummy excavations in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And there was a strong trade on the market in the remains of mummies. And oftentimes when a mummy was found, it was broken into parts and sold individually because that could fetch more money on this market. That's why many of the mummy portraits that we have from Roman e Egypt are simply pieces, just like this one, that have been cut off of a larger mummy. And there's no way to be able to capture the full scale of evidence for who these individuals were. And it's important to have this full picture, though, as this, as this first image shows that we saw, this looks like a very neatly wrapped image, but once we look inside um, via x-ray or CT scanning, we see that with this individual, the, the boy was actually wrapped up in an advanced state of decomposition. The upper incisors and canines are missing. The ribs and spinal column are, were in a state of utter confusion. The humeri have been disarticulated and placed in positions to consolidate the thorax. The disjointed radii and ulna are so placed as to perform a similar function for the abdomen and pelvis, and so on. And so having this complete picture actually gives us a better understanding of burial practices in the past because we can see the Im what's happening inside this neatly wrapped mummy is very different from how it appears on the outside. And that gives us a, a, a more in-depth understanding of burial rites at this time in Roman Egypt. And so we need to treat the remains of past individuals very carefully, um, both to respect them as past people and also to understand um, their condition and uh, the identity of these people in the past, their lives, and then the rituals in which they were buried. Another very thorny issue is the issue of ethnicity and race. Um, the ancient Mediterranean was a very multicultural world. It was at the border between three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And the art from the period depicts a variety of people of different ethnicities and different races. However, in the past, the conception of ethnicity and race was very different from what we have today. And so we need to be very careful to not transpose our own ideas of ethnicity and race into the past when we understand these identities. 
and the people of the past because it was a very multicultural world. And while there are writings, texts from ancient Greeks and Romans that describe ethnocentric viewpoints and ideas of the genos or the, the kinship units and ethnicities, these are very different from what we think of as ethnicity and slash or race today. And so we always need to be very careful with that. Um, and we also need to be careful when dealing with art depicting humans in the past because it's, in all cases, even in these very realistic mummy uh, portraits that we see from Roman Egypt, it, it is beholden by stylistic conventions and artistic conventions of the period. So, for example, a study of the human remains associated with this mummy portrait showed that the individual was actually only three to four years old, which is younger than the painting. Uh, than what seems to be depicted in the painting. And so this is probably a decision made by artists at the time to make this individual look slightly older um, to follow the conventions of the period. As well, when we see iconography or we use scientific tools to identify um, the ethnicity, not the ethnicity, the ancestry of past individuals, we need to be careful in how we describe it because our world is very racially charged. Um, so for example, in an illuminating article, Sarah Durbu, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, described this specific um, oinakoi or wine pitcher. Um, and she was wondering, she, she discusses how to describe this. The term black is unsuitable because it transports our modern color politics into antiquity. As well, even the geographical marker African is not quite suitable because the idea of Africa did not exist in the past. It was vague at that time of production around 500 BC. And the terms that they used and the etymologies they used are not quite accurate for how we think of Africa or Africans. Um, instead, uh, Professor Durbu um, argues that black glazed, which is an artistic term, it has to do with the type of production that we see, um, for this type of vase is preferable because it extends beyond its modern politicized counterpart, black. The hyphen emphasizes its artificial status and the label reflects artistic license rather than historical prejudices. And lastly, we need to be very careful not to assume that we understand the identity of individuals that today we would consider black. Um, and so, for example, several art historians have argued that these individuals depicted on such vases um, were servants in the symposium. And yes, there is some literary evidence that could support that some people that we would identify as black were servants, but other ancient Greek texts contradict this characterization. Homeric epics describe black people as semi-divine creatures whose country was a relaxing oasis for the gods. Furthermore, visual references on ancient Greek vases de depict black people in numerous roles as political allies, musicians, religious worshipers, soldiers, and servants. And so we need to be very careful in how we characterize people in the past at all times. And this care that we need to take also exists when we talk about more scientific tools such as ADNA, ancient DNA. When we look at the genetic um, makeup of humans, what we realize is that there's a lot of overlap and ambiguity. G genetics cannot define what we think of today as races. There's too much overlap and there's too much uh, differentiation within the individual groups we have. For example, two people of European descent may be more genetically similar to an Asian person than they are to each other. And so these ideas that we have in modern society of race and ethnicity, we cannot actually sharply delineate them in our DNA. And so this goes against, of course, all those home DNA kits that you might want to purchase to understand your, your ethnicity or race. But it's actually the reality. The human condition is such that we are all related to one another. Instead, what DNA can tell us is how related people are to one another, statistically speaking, in a sense, as well as it can talk about ancestry. Um, or different adaptive genetic traits that we might have, such as lactose tolerance. And so we need to be very careful, and not, especially when reading articles on the internet or in newspapers or magazines, of understanding that if there are simplistic references to ethnicity or race, either based on archaeological evidence or genetic evidence, that these do not 
correlate well with how scholars see these pieces of evidence. Instead, scholars mostly see a multicultural past with a lot of overlap, variation, diversity, intermingling, and migration that's going on. It was a very complicated past that we all have come from. It's not so simple as we oftentimes put it um, in arguments today. And this then relates to the very tools that we use to study ancient individuals. Um, we still use biometry today. We take measurements on bones all the time. But we have to be very careful not to do that in an ethnic or racial way. Back in the early 20th and late 19th century, there was a science called craniometry that took measurements on skulls to identify the races that skulls belong to. This has been long debunked. There are no sharp delineations in measurements of skulls. But we do still measure bones. And this is a valuable tool for us to understand size. Um, and uh, size changes over time, size differences between biological sexes, size differences between ages. Um, all of these things are very valuable. We can also measure more precise things like the size of different pathologies or muscle attachments to understand uh, the, ex the life experience of individuals that we are studying. But we do not use biometry, the measurement of biological remains, to identify ethnicity or race. So as you can see, studying human remains is very tricky, particularly with the kind of way that it's portrayed in movies and in pop culture. And so scholarly study, on the other hand, is to approaches this in a much more nuanced fashion. And so let's look at how we can do this. First of all, we need to be very careful when we find human remains. They're oftentimes in very complicated scenarios. I helped excavate some commingled graves at the Greek colony of Khersonisos in the Crimean Peninsula. And the recording procedure we did shows just how careful you need to be. The remains can be mingled together of different individuals, and we need to carefully capture the spatial information to understand burial practices, but also to understand how the remains of these two individuals that will be studied in the lab related to their finds in the field. So I'm going to cut to a quick video of my colleague Elijah Fleming showing her excavation of a, a, child, a child tomb at Histria. Do you want to explain a little bit what you're doing? Sure. Uh, we are going to expose the top part of this grave so we can hopefully come down right on top of our skeleton so we can see uh, the entire outline, which will help us uh, in discussing different types of mortuary rituals, hopefully perhaps come down on if there are any grave goods, we'll be able to see them the way they're laid out. Um, we'll also be able to make sure we get all of these small, small bones, because we assume from the size of this, that it could be a child. So I'm going to try to loosen just this top we hopefully don't disturb anything underneath too terribly much. So as you can see, we need to be very careful and slowly excavate human remains uh, out of respect for the individual that we are uncovering, but also to help understand the, the, the individual and the burial practices involved. I'm going to use an example here of some of my own research. I am studying several buried horses in the, in the cemetery outside of Athens at Phaleron. And so the layout of these horses tells us a lot. And the reason I know this is the excavators very carefully captured with photographs the layout of these horses. And my laboratory study identified a cut mark on this individual horse. It was right where the arrow is pointing. And that cut mark would not have been from butchery to get flesh off the horse to eat, because this horse skeleton is fully articulated and complete. And instead, I think that what was going on is that this cut mark was done in order to position this horse into a pose. It was part of the burial ritual. We have several horses at this site that are posed similarly in, in their burial. 
And so what that indicates is probably that there was care in showing this in a certain way. This, could have, this probably was an example of sacrifice. This was not an old horse. And so part of the display of the funeral for the individual that was happening was to sacrifice this horse and bury it in a pose that makes it look as if it's running or leaping or otherwise a more uh, glorious pose, let's say. And then it was covered over of course, so it's part of the spectacle of the funeral of the individual. And we can only understand this through careful excavation. As well, careful excavation is important because human remains are very fragile. And so if we, if, if we excavate them in a rush or a hurry, we're going to damage them, and we're going to lose the very small, micro, sometimes microscopic traces that tell us about the lives of these individuals. For example, this well in Hellenistic Athens showed hundreds of children that were um, buried and positioned inside this well. And for decades, scholars thought that this was uh, infanticide or human sacrifice or something uh, magnanimous and over the top like that. However, a more detailed recent study of these remains shows that they all cluster soon after birth. And instead, they closely um, parallel um, natural infant mortality in a pre-modern society. And so it's only through studying the careful characteristics on these bones, taking careful measurements to be able to give a decent age of these individuals, that Mariah Liston and her colleagues could come to this conclusion that this was how the Athenians at this time dealt with natural infant mortality. They did not deposit their infants in cemeteries, but rather in more special deposits like this well. And I, again, since I'm an animal bone person, I'm going to use an example of, uh, of uh, this ancient Roman dog from Carthage, buried in the third century CE, and how we can study the remains of such an individual to be able to understand the life ways and understand life in the past. And these same methods are used, of course, to study human remains. Um, this dog was quite small, similar probably to the one on the gravestone of Melisto, seen on the right. In the past, these dogs were known as Maltese, and we need to be careful. Modern breeds of dogs and horses and other animals do not correlate well with our ancient breeds. While we can identify them genetically, they're all due to more modern selective breeding. Um, and so ancient uh, dogs and horses and other animals did not fall into such types, but we do know that there were types of very small lap dogs like this, and they were oftentimes nicknamed Maltese dogs. Um, and so this would have been somebody's pet. It was given very careful burial. And the study of the bones can tell us a lot. So look at this skull. Maybe pause the video. Can you see what's wrong with this dog? This dog died of old age and was very sick. Can you tell? Well, the reality is, is there's no upper teeth. And if you look very closely at where the upper teeth would have been, bone has grown over the, the holes where the roots would have been. And so what that means is all these teeth were lost during the life of the dog while, while she was still alive. And so this very much impacted the life of this dog. In the lower jaws, there were only three teeth left. And that's it. So this was a very, very sick dog that would have had to eat a special diet. As well, there are pathologies up and down the skeleton of this dog. She had very bad arthritis. If you compare a picture of her pelvis on the left with a picture of a healthy pelvis on the right, maybe pause the video. Can you see what's gone on here? So what has gone on here is at one point, the, the leg was dislocated and the, the, at the hip. And the ball joint of the femur ended up grinding a new socket into the pelvis. And so this dog was in a lot of pain and probably could not walk very well. But what can we learn from this? It's not just a sad story. In many ways, it's a very touching story because this dog was very clearly loved. It was given a special diet. She was probably carried around, and, and she was somebody's treasured pet, and at, at the end of her life, given a very important burial in a cemetery. And so studying these remains very closely can tell us about how humans cared for their pets. And of course, we can take these same concepts and we can show the care that humans had for their fellow humans um, by seeing examples of, of sick individuals that were cared for and kept alive and helped to, be, helped to survive um, in their life, even though they were very sick. 
We can also, of course, see heavy traumatic in incidences such as infant mortality or other forms of mortality um, because studying death is a very heavy subject. And as I've always tried to emphasize here, we need to be very respectful. The last thing I want to talk about is some new methods that archaeologists are using. They're not super new. They're a couple decades old. But unlike ancient DNA, this one makes the headlines a little less. But in my mind, it can tell us a lot more. Um, this is multi-isotope studies. Isotopes can tell us a ton. I, the, what this is is it compares the ratios of different isotopes in human and even animal or plant remains that can tell us about what they were eating. So it can tell us about the water that they were drinking, the food that they were consuming. And through that, since the water comes from uh, an area with a specific geology, as you can see in the map on the right, we can see maybe if these um, humans or plants or animals were deposited in a different location than where they grew up. Because locked into their teeth, for example, is the signature, the geological signature, of the area they grew up, which might be the same or different from the signature of where they were deposited after they uh, were no longer alive. Um, and so we can use strontium and even sulfur isotope ratios to understand the movement of people through the water they were consuming. We can use, on the other hand, something like nitrogen isotope ratios to understand the food that people were eating. And so the reason for this is that based on where an individual organism is on the trophic level or food chain, they have a different nitrogen isotope ratio. And so at the very bottom, with the lowest ratio, you see the primary producers, photosynthesizers such as plants. Above that, you see herbivores then carnivores, and then top carnivores. And by tracing the ratios of nitrogen isotopes in past humans and animals, we can actually understand where they were on the food chain and get a sense of what they were consuming, how much animal protein versus plant products. And this is a very valuable technique to be able to understand mobility in the past, in the case of strontium, but also diet. And so this can really help us understand when we combine it with skeletal studies, ancient DNA studies, and even the material culture remains left with people, we can have a much better understanding of socioeconomic status, identity, and the lives of ancient people to be able to put together these questions in a bioarchaeological manner. Well, thanks for listening. I hope that this enlightened you with some different techniques we can use. I hope you now have a better understanding of some of the problems that exist with studying human remains in today's world and take this knowledge because it's powerful to understand archaeology and our own human past.